Yes, slow it down. I haven't been struck with the YouTube demonetization leech outside of maybe one or two videos. But there are very many great channels who are being ravaged by a wave of demonetization that is going to starve out many up and coming channels for whom YouTube is only a side hustle at this point. Those channels who sort of need this ad revenue. So while the issue of YouTube and the adpocalypse send questions about the fairness and integrity of YouTube as they apply or relax their guidelines for creators, while this isn't really my problem, that doesn't mean it isn't a problem. What's right and fair is right and fair, and how it affects me doesn't change the objective rightness or fairness of it. Over the past year, YouTube has been receiving heat from a lot of different creators because of their new trigger-happy response to videos that they deem not suitable for advertisers. These videos are set aside to receive nearly no advertising or, in many cases, they're completely blacklisted from having ads placed on them at all. Obviously, this leaves the creator of that video without ad revenue that they normally would have gotten. Now, YouTube does have a system in place to appeal your video's status, but when you consider that most content on YouTube receives the bulk of its views shortly after it's uploaded, you're still going to miss out on many of those sweet, sweet advertising dollars. One of my videos was demonetized, so I submitted it for this review. That was over a month ago. I've heard nothing and I've seen no change. At this point, I've pretty much missed out on that ad revenue. Now, I can't really complain too much because this hasn't been a problem that's afflicted me, but many others do have it much worse. Now, I want to talk about what brings me to this video in general. There was this terrible shooting that happened in Las Vegas and Casey Neistat made a video about ways that fellow YouTubers and his subscribers, ways they could help those who may need it out in Las Vegas. He didn't glorify the event. He didn't even cover the event as a breaking news story, and he didn't show images of the event that had transpired. The video is just a guy sitting in front of his camera, doing what he thought he could to help these people and showing some serious love to a community that was in some serious pain. Well, for this, his video was rendered as not suitable for advertisers. This despite Casey explicitly stating that all the ad revenue from that video would be going to a GoFundMe page that he had set up for making collections. While that GoFundMe has raised well over a quarter of a million dollars, it still feels strange that YouTube can't make some kind of exception or even a rapid review to ensure the bulk of these early views generate some ad revenue. And here's the part that makes you really question the integrity and fairness of YouTube. Casey tweeted his outrage about this video and it actually prompted a response from YouTube. And I guess that seems reasonable enough. You make the rules, you follow the rules. But this was later particularly upsetting when Philip DeFranco tweeted out a message where he compared Casey's video with Jimmy Kimmel's monologue about the Vegas attacks, which was not only the number one video on YouTube's trending page, but it was also covered with ads. You know, the same ads that Casey was refused. So while YouTube claimed that its guidelines meant Casey would not receive monetization, here we have the number one trending video on the YouTube platform raking in views and advertising dollars while being about the same exact subject as Casey Neistat's video. Now it does turn out there's this upper tier of YouTube users who are able to do what YouTube calls partner sold ads. And this is what ABC was doing here for Jimmy Kimmel. But it still leaves kind of a foul taste in your mouth, especially if you're a smaller creator who doesn't have the recourse and the power of a corporation like ABC and its sales teams and its considerable clout. As a side note, 
YouTube says they're working to find a way to prevent partner-sold ads from appearing on questionable or controversial YouTube videos as well. But somehow, I don't think this is the solution. It's not that the creators don't want ABC to have ads. They just want to be able to have ads on their own videos. Don't further constrict and limit the platform. Find a way to build an advertising network that allows for a freedom of content creation and expression without the implicit sort of slap of censorship, meaning no ad dollars, for creators who don't meet YouTube's arbitrary guidelines. And speaking of these guidelines, they seem to be loosely applied at best. Some people seem to get slammed for using profanity in their videos, while others remain untouched. Some news channels seem to get hammered, while other opinion or news channels seem to skate by completely unscathed. And I'm not even a guy who curses or swears in my personal life or my videos, but this system will currently lump a video with some profanity in it along with the video of some extremist that's used to recruit terrorists or inspire others to acts of terrorism. There seems to be a complete failure of judgment at YouTube. The role of a judge is to interpret and apply the law on a case-by-case -case basis, and this allows the justice system to account for varying circumstances and severity of the crime, the context surrounding the crime, and how the law is applied to the facts at hand. This is the most merciful method. Not every murder is the most severe murder. You may have killed somebody in a car accident, or even worse, you may have gotten extremely out of this world angry and murdered somebody in a crime of passion. Or still worse, you may have stalked somebody and planned their murder in a cold and calculated way. Now, based on what we've seen from YouTube, if they ran the justice system, you would be executed for any of these offenses because they don't seem to allow any breathing room for nuance or context or the circumstances surrounding a video. If the video breaks the rule, it must be punished. But hey, maybe if YouTube did run the justice system, you would get a nice little way to appeal your case, and maybe they would get to it before the hangman fixed your noose. This lack of good faith by the general community toward the YouTube overlords is only further accentuated when you have a recently uploaded video exposing a New York Times employee who was boasting about getting things to the front page of YouTube, quote, because he had friends at YouTube who curate the front page. Sounds bizarre, but it would explain how and even why the front page and trending pages of YouTube often seem so irregular in the fact that Content that is not being well received sometimes is featured prominently, while other content that seems to be blowing up is left off entirely. And the trending page is also bizarrely regular in the fact that seemingly every late night show host and a select number of YouTube creators regularly make appearances on the page no matter what. This does raise the question though, do we have to tailor our content to the subjective morality and sensibilities of a programmed YouTube AI bot or what some panel of internet justice fighters think is okay? This is a subjective morality at best and it's going to be an ever moving target. What happens when today's normal becomes tomorrow's taboo? And in an age where we're being conditioned to be ever more offended, where does this path lead us? In YouTube's About section of their Impact Creator Lab, they have a statement about freedom of opportunity, where they say, We believe everyone should have a chance to be discovered, build a business, and succeed on their own terms, and that people, not gatekeepers, decide what's popular. Yet it would seem that we do have to bend ourselves to the gatekeepers who decide what can and cannot be monetized and what will or won't be promoted. Content on YouTube already now consists of seemingly 80% Jake Paul, Jake Paul reactions, diss tracks, and reactions to diss tracks. And with the current crackdown 
of edgy content or newsworthy content or really pretty much anything that resembles real life, I think YouTube stands poised to lose an entire genre of content and creators. Edgy content is one of the things that makes YouTube so much different than your canned, controlled, and propagandized television. YouTube is setting the stage for edgy content creators to leave the platform and find revenue elsewhere. I think one of the only things that is holding these creators on the platform is the thought that YouTube will still bring them more traffic than any alternative in the marketplace. But once creators have confidence in a competing platform's ability to deliver both traffic and ad revenue, YouTube will find itself hurting where it really matters to them. The wallet. I understand that the website and video platform does belong to YouTube. It's their house, they make the rules. They made the website and they serve the videos. But it's people like you and me who've built the community and created the content. And we have really made YouTube what it has become. Without you and me, YouTube is basically, well, it's basically Google Plus, cold, empty and totally devoid of life. So while creators yell and feud with YouTube and YouTube struggles to find a solution to this admittedly complex problem, a vacuum has started to open up in the online video space. And while nobody has been able to do it yet, we'll soon see if someone has the savvy, the ambition and the resources to create a real online video competitor that can poach big time creators away from YouTube and provide them with better advertising dollars and an audience good enough to get by with. YouTube really needs to play their cards right because in this high stakes game of internet video poker, one wrong move could cause the whole thing to fold.